I want to uh, just point out to you there are two baptism sites on the Jordan River. One is the tourist one. It's up, it's clean water, it's up near the Sea of Galilee. Uh, there's tr dressing rooms. The, the, the pastor who's doing the baptizing gets a free cup of tea. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's there for the tourist. And then there's the authentic site that's down uh, in Judea. It's muddy. It's in Palestinian territory. There's, you drive into that space with tall uh, fences on either side with signs all along the way, landmines, landmines, landmines. And sometimes you can't get in there because of the, uh, because of the, the, the stress and, and the political upheaval of, of the relations there. And we were able to go to the real place, uh, the real place, uh, the muddy place, the muddy place. I, is that how you imagined the place where Jesus Christ was baptized? That's the place. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, it's the same place. Because right next to the road there, I mean, just, just coming in there, uh, on the, uh, you guys are ready for me to preach. I see you're, you're pushing that. Uh, there's uh, the Samaritan Mountains. I mean, uh, just a stone's throw right there, Samaritan Mountains. There was a Syrian, a Syrian uh, commander, Naaman, who had leprosy. He went to Samaria, to the king there, and said, I, I hear there's a prophet that can pray for me and make me well. And Elijah stepped in and said, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of this. And he sent him down to that same muddy water, that unimpressive, muddy little Jordan River, the same place that Jesus was baptized. And there he dipped seven times. I want to say something to you about uh, going to the Holy Land. Uh, there are a lot of pilgrims who think they can receive grace or, or some sort of spiritual endowment by touching the rocks or touching the dirt or being baptized in the water. I want to say this to you so that there's no misunderstanding in case uh, it ever comes up. There's one baptism. Don't dishonor your baptism by going off and seeing it as something less than and that you need to be baptized again because there might be some special spiritual renewal in being baptized again. We can be renewed all the time. We can be renewed today. Our prayer is that we rededicate ourselves through the taking of the communion today. But there's one baptism. And don't dishonor your baptism by wanting to be baptized again if you've already truly been baptized. Thankfully, Tao had never been baptized. Never. That lady's been ministering to us all these years and never been baptized. Wasn't a member of the church. We voted her in the first service. Sorry, you, you missed that blessing. Amen. But, uh, Amen. But anyway, let's, let's, uh, let's get into the word today, and let me lead us in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for uh, calling your people together and drawing those whose hearts are seeking. And God, we do pray that today will be a day of rededication as we gather around your table and remember what you've done for us. And Lord, we also pray, God, that it uh, will not just be a day of rededication, but it will be a day of salvation for those who are holding on, that the, 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 the world, the, the spirits of this world, the, the pleasure of this world, the, stra the strains and anxieties of this world have a grip in their heart, in their life. God, please break them free that they might rush to you and be saved. We pray now, Lord, for this time in your word. Please, Lord, help us to hear you. And Lord, please now speak. Through your word in the name of Jesus we pray amen our message today begins around the year 2242 BC that's a long 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 time ago 2242 BC it's a hundred years after the flood if you can think back that far God had told the people to fill the earth and subdue it that's what he told them go out fill the earth subdue it but what did the people say in Genesis 11? They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. They didn't want to be scattered. They didn't want to fill the earth. They wanted to build a city and stay together. And so they disobeyed God. What did God do to them in the place of that Tower of Babel? Yeah, he did. Verse 9 of Genesis 11 says, There the Lord confused the language of the whole world, from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. And so they scattered. And people went off in all their different directions and all their 
languages becoming their different tribes and peoples of the world. And with every generation, the knowledge of the true God that they had experienced was fading. Replaced in their hearts with mythical ideas of false gods. We know that Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham had four sons. They are Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The youngest of those, Canaan, had a lot of sons. And he was the father of all these peoples, the Canaanite peoples. The father of the Sidonians, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvidites, the Zimmerites, and the Hamathites. Amen? <laughs> Can I get an amen? Uh, and that is the Canaanite people. And Genesis 10, 19 says, The borders of Canaan reached from Sidon, way up there at the top. Sidon's going to factor into our message today. So remember Sidon there on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the borders of Canaan reached from Sidon towards Gerar. See, far down here on the left, the southernmost left uh, western city, Gerar. And as far as Gaza, Gaza's right there, over to Sodom and Gomorrah. When we were near the Dead Sea, we looked for Sodom and Gomorrah. They're not there. Uh, and Adma right there, and Zeboim as far as Lasha, that southernmost place there at the foot of the Dead Sea. The Canaanite people, these tribes, they gathered in that place and began to believe, not in the God who created them and sent them out, but they began to believe in a God named Baal. Baal developed an elaborate mythology surrounding him. This Baal God defeated the other gods that were equal to him and rose to power, overthrowing El, the father God. And the, the adults would tell the children the stories and the myths of Baal around the fires at night before bedtime. Baal ruled over, they said, the storms and fertility. Baal sired a bull with a cow. I have no comment on that. But the bull holds a special place in the worship on his behalf. And his worship, the worship of Baal, included pleasure and pain. Pleasure being the ritual prostitution that was part of his worship. Numbers 25 says that while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to sacrifice to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods, so Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. And the Lord's anger burned against them. Ritual prostitution. Amos 2.7, this ritual prostitution in the name of Baal continued on in the time of Amos. In Amos 2.7 it says, Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. How disgusting is that? Not only is there ritual prostitution in the worship of Baal, but there's child sacrifice that the Canaanite people, for some reason, thought was the pleasure of Baal. In 2 Kings 17, verse 15, it says, They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, Do not do as they do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves, and an Asherah pole, and they bowed down to all the starry host, and they worshipped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and sought omens and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. This is the worship of Baal, ritual prostitution and child sacrifice. The people of Canaan worshipped Baal in this way to seek his pleasure so that he would send the rain and bless the flocks and the herds and the families with fertility. And the Israelites entered this land of Canaan after they came out of Egypt and wandered in the wilderness. They crossed that Jordan River that we just saw near that same place. And after they crossed there, and after they lived there for some time, Joshua, their courageous leader, 
died at the age of 110. He just couldn't go on forever, could he? And it says in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the, who? The Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asterisks. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. That's the story of the judges. They forgot God. They forsook God. They, they began to worship the Baals and the, and the false gods of the land that they entered. And because of that, all the promises that God gave them in Deuteronomy, promises to bless, were lifted. And all the promises in Deuteronomy, the promises to curse, came in. They forsook God. And God said, okay, if you don't want me, you won't have me. It's a scary thing to be a people who say, we don't want God anymore. God help our country as we move further and further into being a land that doesn't want God anymore. His hand of protection begins to lift. And that's a fearful thing. In Judges 3, 5, it says, The Israelites lived among the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And they took their daughters in marriage and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. And so we see in Judges... These people continue to forget God and worship Baal and things get bad as they forsake God so bad that they find themselves in great distress and then they cry out to God, Oh God, we remember you, help us! And God sends them a deliverer again and again and again through the judges because God loves them and he wants us to return to him. So he sends people like Othniel and Shamgar. Shamgar, an underutilized name in churches. If you're one of our young couples thinking about having children, <laughs> consider the name Shamgar. Or Deborah, Gideon, the judges of deliverance from God. Those people in those days were completely contaminated with the false gods, and Baal in particular. They reasoned to themselves that if one God is good, two is better, and so why not worship and serve both? And all the prophets would rail and they would be seen as oh so extreme because they'd say you can serve only one god he's a jealous god and he will not share his worship with another remember also as we think about the tug of war through the generations between baal and yahweh baal's not nothing he's something first corinthians 10 16 says consider the people of israel do not those who eat the sacrifices of, to idols participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to what? Demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons he will not share and Baal's not nothing he was birthed with a lie from the demons these are false gods that revel in immorality and the blood of infants and there's a tug of war for the hearts of the people with the one true God that delivers from slavery and into a land of promise who blesses in every way to those who are faithful to him we turn now to 1 Kings, and we're introduced to a true believer in Baal. Oh, is she a true believer in Baal? This is the princess Jezebel. Her name has, and she's the son of the king of Sidon. We saw Sidon on the map a second ago. King Ethbaal. Baal is in the core of who they are in their belief in their religion. 
And she marries, is given in marriage to Ahab, the king of Israel, and both of them serve Baal with full devotion. They build a temple to Baal. They host the 450 prophets of Baal at their table, becoming their sponsors, giving them room and board and support. They sought to purge Israel of all the Yahweh worship. They broke down all the altars and places of worship to Yahweh God, seeking to, to eradicate God in Israel. They pursued the prophets and killed, to their knowledge, all of them, although they missed a few, as we'll read in a minute. In 1 Kings 16, verse 30, it says, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Naboth. You know what Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, did? Jeroboam was the first king of Israel, of the northern kingdom. And he set up a golden bull in Dan and in Samaria. And he said to Israel, come to this place, not to Jerusalem. <coughs> Losing my voice. Behold, O Israel... These are your gods, golden bull, drawing the people's worship to Baal. And so Ahab is so much worse than even Jeroboam. He married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord the God of Israel, then did all the kings of Israel before him. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. We begin our story for today, our true account. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe. That's where Tishbe is. Right there on the other side of the Jordan River. Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will, neither, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. I can tell you with full validity, I guess, it's hot and dry in Israel. It's hot and dry in Israel. One of the people in our tour brought a poncho, and our tour guide just laughed and laughed and laughed. The rains won't fall. They don't fall until October at the latest November. And if those rains don't come, it's a devastating thing there in the desert in Israel. Water is so important to the people there. If those rains don't come, it's a problem. People know the locations of every spring, creek, and brook because knowing those places will save your life. They give all their directions based on a, a source of water. When Elijah says to Ahab, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word, that's a stark and devastating pronouncement if those rains don't come. Ahab and Jezebel killed the Lord's prophets, broke down the Lord's altars, tried to systematically erase Yahweh from his land. Psalm 42, 1 says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? They're going to learn, the people are going to learn that as much as they need water, they need God even more. Do you know the story? God sends Elijah to the Kareth Ravine on the other side of the Jordan River where he will drink. Well, anyway, he will drink from the brook and the ravens will feed him food. That's a good gig, isn't it? I remember one of my early sermons I preached was, what do you do when your brook dries up? I stole it from another preacher because that's what young preachers do. But uh, that's, those were those days when he lived by the brook. But then in chapter 17, verse 7, it says, Sometime later the brook dried up because there had been no rain. And then the word of the Lord 
came to him and said, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of where? Sidon. And that's interesting, isn't it? God sent him up to Jezebel's neighborhood. I guess in hiding her, him, hiding Elijah, he knew that Jezebel wouldn't look where she came from. She looked everywhere else. And he was hidden there. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. And so he disappeared into the villages of Zarephath and this widow and her son took care of him. And that prepares us now for the big showdown that we're going to read about and briefly discuss in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18, after a long time, verse 1, in the third year, okay, so this is after the, the third year has passed, so we're into the fourth year, so we're, it's about three and a half years total. After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, his palace administrator. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. Guys, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. God has his people everywhere, even in the palace of Ahab. There are devout Believers in the Lord. And while Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. I bet that water was precious too. Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going to one direction and Obadiah in another and as Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him and bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my Lord Elijah? Yes, he replied. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. Verse 9. What have I done, asked Obadiah, that you're handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? And we, here we have Obadiah just being really, really anxious and kind of dramatic. And we're not going to read all this because he's just being a big baby. Okay, so we're going to move on, skip all that. You can read about Obadiah and his anxiety attack later. <laughs> Verse 14, now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah's here. He will kill me. And Elijah said, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went out to meet Elijah. Do you think, Eli you think Ahab appreciated being summoned to Elijah? You come to me. Ahab. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. And Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said what? Nothing. That's what you do when you, make, when you have no intention of changing. You shrug. You show indifference. You wait for the uncomfortable conversation to be over so you can go back to doing what you were already doing. You say nothing. It's a standoff, isn't it? Some young people will do this when their parents or an adult tries to speak into their life. They'll say, oh, please think about your choices you're making. Please think about the friends that you're making. Please think about the behaviors that you're engaged in. And some young people will just look and say, what? Nothing. That's what a family member will do when the other family members confront them about the bad path that they're on and plead them with them to stop. Please, please consider what you're doing and don't, don't do this. And that family member will say, nothing. It's what lost people sometimes say, when you ask them to believe in Jesus, they say nothing. 
That's what church people sometimes do when you ask them to obey the word, be faithful to God, and share the gospel. Hey, let's go today, this afternoon, let's go share the gospel in some neighborhoods. Who's with me? And the people said, nothing. Who wants to close in prayer today? And the people said, nothing. Waiting for the uncomfortable moment to pass. He'll move on, he'll say something else, and I'll get away with this with a shrug and indifference. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Let's keep going. Verse 22. And Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's, of the Lord's prophets left. We know there's those hundred, but this, he's the only one that's out of the cave. He's the only one, the only man of God who's standing. There's nobody else. He's alone in the stand in the nation. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call the name of your God and I'll call the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire. He's God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. This whole thing is weighted heavily in Baal's favor. Did you see that? They get to make all the choices and they get to go first. They get to look at these bulls and try to decide which one's more flammable. Right? There's 450 of them. They got more prayers and more prayers. He's one guy. One guy. The crowd is on the side of the prophets of Baal. This is home field advantage for them. And they get all the time they need. Confident that the God that they have faithfully served and that has been worshipped for thousands of years in Canaan will certainly answer. Verse 26 says, They called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us! They shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. They danced, they prophesied, they shouted. They slashed themselves with swords and spears until the blood flowed, it says. And about noon, Elijah started giving them a hard time. You know this story. Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping or must be awakened. Verse 29. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Elijah went second. He took the second bull. Working alone, he rebuilt a broken and abandoned altar to God that had been destroyed by Jezebel and her followers. He put it back together again using 12 stones, and he made a point of every stone reminding the people that were there, this is who we are. We're the 12 tribes of Israel that have been freed from slavery and delivered to this land. We are God's people. Remember who you are. He had this offering, prepared this bull, and drenched it in four jars of water three times. The whole thing was soaked and the trench around it was filled with water. Verse 36. Here we go. At the time of the sacrifice, which is 3 o'clock in the afternoon, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. And that I'm your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you're turning their hearts back again. That was his prayer. That was his prayer. God, let them know that you're God in Israel. And let them know that everything that's happened here was because you commanded it and draw their hearts back to you again. What happened? What happened? 
crack a boom. That's what happened. Fire came down from the sky. That's what happened. In the the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice what we were expecting. But then it burned up the wood, which you would think. But then it burned up the stones. That's really hot fire. And then the soil. And it licked up the water in the trench. Oh, God. And then all the people saw this. They fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Woo! The rest of the story you probably know. He prayed, it rained. They killed the prophets of Baal. And Jezebel was mad. The end. <laughs> Thursday a week ago, Sherry, Millie, David, Tao, and I were on Mount Carmel. We were on the roof of a monastery with an overlook. And we could see, and if we looked west, we saw the Mediterranean Sea where Elijah prayed. And eventually, after seven tries, the little servant saw that little cloud coming. And we turned this way and looked to the east and to the south and to the north. And oh, what we saw when we looked that direction. The most moving thing of the whole week, I think, for me. As we looked in that direction, east, north, and south, we saw the Kishon Valley and Naboth's vineyard. We saw in the distance, just over here, a little a city now. It used to be a small village. It's Nazareth, at the foot of the mountain, over here. And over here was Nain, where Jesus stopped the widow whose, hus- whose son had just died. And he, he brought the little boy at his funeral back to life again. Below, you could see the city of Jezreel, where Jezebel will be eaten by dogs in a later chapter. The far mountains, we're on Mount Carmel. The far mountains on the other side are Mount Tabor, where Jesus was transfigured. And Mount Gilead, where Saul and Jonathan die in war with the Philistines. I said Mount Gilboa, right? Mount Tabor, Mount Gilboa. At the foot of that mountain is Endor, where Saul sought counsel from a witch. We have Teacher's Hill, where Gideon defeated the Midianites, and where Deborah, Barak, and Jael took care of Sisera, the commander of the army of Canaan. God has done great things on Mount Carmel, and on the mountains that face Mount Carmel, and in the valley below. God has done such great things. I'd like to say today that as we read about Elijah and the prophets of Baal, that was the last clash between God and false gods in this world. God and the evil belief system of this world and the demons that feed it. That that was the final showdown, but it wasn't. Every generation has to rediscover that the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Jezreel Valley below Mount Carmel, as you look out, it's a bowl. It's a massive bowl. It's, it's huge. You have the mountains over there. You got the Samaritan mountains down here. You got Lebanon up here, and it's just a huge, huge coliseum. It's a theater. Down in that valley, you have the city of Jezreel, but you also have the city of Tel Megiddo. Tel Megiddo. Tel Megiddo is the place that Revelation 16, verse 16, is calls Armageddon, where demons that look like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon and the false prophet and the beast, they lead all the kings and all the peoples of the world to gather against God and his people in this valley. This is the place. This is the end. And the testimony of all these mountains and all these cities is that God wins. He did win. He will win again. And he will win in the end. It's the truth. And the whole story points to it. So...
Why do you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal or whatever idol you want to choose instead is God, follow that. There's no room for two opinions. You can't serve two masters. I got excited. I ran off and left my notes. <laughs> How long will you wait between two opinions? Who do you belong to? Who do you belong to? Who owns your heart? I just want to point out to you that God was not eager to condemn the people of Israel. He wanted them back. He wanted them back. He did all of this to bring them back again. And he wants your heart. And he wants you back again. Today is a day of rededication. And I pray with all my heart that today is a day of salvation. We actually had somebody say they wanted to be saved in the first service, responded to the invitation, and maybe, just maybe, you're ready to break free of the gods of this world and rush to Jesus Christ who came to save you. Let me pray for you now, and if you have a decision as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, if you need to pray with somebody, if you're ready to ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord, if there's just something that you need to do with God today and you need help doing it, then come and meet me here on the floor. As our musicians come, and they're on the way, let me pray for you now. Lord, as we prepare now for the Lord's Supper, Lord, as we think about the call to single-minded and single-hearted devotion, the call to serve you if you are God, and I know, I know you are. We know you are. And God, please help us to respond as you call us. We pray, God, for those that haven't yet given their life to you and pray for those of us who have. God, help us to be wholly yours and respond to you today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Won't you stand? Won't you stand? God's calling you to come. Won't you come?